So, um, oh, I'm, I'm pretty loud. But I, oh, so, okay. So here I am after uh, I have this microphone. And I am here to talk with you about the history of improvised theater. I'm an actor, and uh, as we know, applied improv is how to apply the exercises from improvised theater into corporate businesses, all kinds of training. So uh, my job, or what I would like to do, is to talk to you a little about the history through the ages, where it all comes from. And uh, the basic question is, uh, is over there, improvised theater or scripted theater? Who was first? Hey? The, the, the question of the chicken and the egg. Um, well, it's a very simple thing. Uh, improvised theater was first. So, whenever people ask you, hey, improvised theater, this is real theater, you can say, well, any scripted theater known comes from improvised theater. We were the first. So we just know. So, um, but let's see. Uh, it's not that easy yeah, to go with the flow. And uh, improvising is not always fun. As you can see, we have a famous improviser, uh, Chet Baker, who was a trumpet player. player. He's, he hated to improvise, but he was very good at it. And uh, it's because he made lots of mistakes, but nobody noticed. Uh, if, you, uh, <laughs> if you listen to him talking about uh, his records, he's saying, oh, this, ah, this note's wrong, oh, this note's wrong, this note's wrong. But people love it. That's, uh, so, um, if, you, if, you, if you talk about history of improvisation, uh, for example, uh, if the, uh, lots of things went wrong. For example, people tried different mushrooms and they died. So, so you have to take some risk. That's what I mean. Improvisation is not always fun. Or if you have uh, the, 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 the Stone Age, uh, somebody had to make a round wheel or carve a round stone to invent the wheel. Everybody probably of his tribe said, huh, what are you doing? He wasn't sort of saying, hey, I'm going to invent the wheel. No, he was just improvising, making mistakes, first probably a square wheel, he didn't call it wheel, but and finally he discovered this, and uh, so that's sort of, that's how it goes. And um, it all started with shamanistic rituals. Let's say, uh, that's why it's fun to have a shamanistic ritual, a ritual this, uh, uh, this uh, evening, because the real improv theater has started over there, and we're talking about Centuries ago, 3,000 centuries, the, the old tribes were then doing like a unga, unga, unga. All these kings because they were re re religious uh, uh, rituals. We know it because uh, this picture is recent from a Mongolian tribe. And uh, uh, actually, a, sham a shaman is the ideal improviser. Right? You, you, do a, you do a warm up, you take some drugs, or you. You just start shaking until you get in contact with your subconscious, so, you're, so there's no blocking anyway. And then you have an audience, and then you have a stage, and then this man or woman or this group of people start making music, dancing, telling stories from the God, and there's nothing which blocks them. Because they're in their subconscious, they're just improvising along the way. So, um, that's why the start of improv theater is, is let's say, two, three thousand years ago. Uh, and then it went on. Uh, these are, this is a picture from uh, Dorian Greeks, mimes. Everybody who sort of knows, hey, Dorian mime rings a bell. Um, the whole thing about it, uh, the, the mask they use, well, they were from leather, so they are sort of gone after two thousand years. But the stone and the, 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 the stone masks, which they carved, they are still saved. And uh, we all know the, the typical, hey, when, you have, when you sort of have a symbol for theater, you have the, 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 those two masks. Actually, 
they are from Dorian Mime. They are, uh, uh, th that's where it comes from. Um, usually the Dorian Mime is, uh, uh, is very important because people couldn't, uh, they couldn't read, write, and uh, they went really crazy about this theory because it was their way of communicating. It was their way of knowing what is happening. Hey, internet nowadays is very simple. Let's say the, 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 the improvised actors of the Dorian Mime was the internet way back. And then, um, uh, because hey, I have to go quick, we go to the Roman and Greek theater. Because officially, hey, I've, I've, I've sort of uh, investigated that officially, theater starts with the Roman and Greek plays, with Euripides, but it's not true. We know this, but the only thing is that uh, uh, improvised plays got more popular, and it needed bigger audience, and it needed bigger plays like this, because uh, you, can, you cannot reach many people on the streets. You need bigger theater, more people. So, people, so, so they started to write it down, Euripides, or started to write things down. And if you take, for example, um, a famous thing like the Ilias from Homeres, that's actually a bunch of, uh, of, uh, of improvised short stories being put together. So that's what I mean, uh, what comes first, the chicken or the egg? Well, improvised theater. Um, I'm just saying, well, uh, my statement is that the whole history would be totally different if people would have listened a little bit more to us, implied improviser. Um, like, for example, uh, applied improv with big consequences. I, I for example, the, imagine you were Maria. Eh? Uh, you, you come home to, to, to your husband and you're pregnant. And your husband says, you're pregnant? But from who? So the improvisation starts, and Maria said, ah, it's from God. <laughs> okay. Yeah, lots of things happened. So it's a child from God. And so the poor Joseph, he had to deal with it. Uh, so, that, so that's one thing which improvisation with big consequences. Another thing is, for example, um, there you have Hannibal. Eh? He, maybe you know Hannibal. He went with 50 elephants and, and, and 25,000 people through the Alps to conquer Italy. Everybody said, mad, you're mad. And he said, no, eh? he didn't have an applied improv training. He said, I stick to my idea. I'm having fun on this stage, and somebody, a colleague, improviser, is calling, hey, I'm off, I'm on, I'm go I want to join. But he says, no, I've got a great idea, I stick to it. Well, uh, we all know the result. Almost all elephants died. He had 21,000 people died in the Alps. O almost all his, his horses died. Well, it was a mess. And basically, it's because he didn't have a good training on applied improvisation, he just stuck to my idea. Uh, one last example, um, here you have Montezuma, eh? Le let's say, uh, that's an old picture, uh, Montezuma was a leader of, was it the director of the Aztecs, a very famous, very well-educated, very well-civilized uh, uh, group, but he had one problem, in a way, um, like he was being told, eh, because of religion, that uh, uh, Quetzalcoatl, eh, I don't know, uh, probably it's not pronounced right, he was a god and he should return to save his kingdom. That's a belief, that was his conviction. And it was, it was, uh, 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 it was said that this, this god would return at the year 1500, 19. What happened? A famous Spaniard, <coughs> uh, Hermon Cortes, came in 1519. He didn't know. He just came at the same, at the same age, over the same century. And Montezuma offered him his whole empire. 
everything he needed, all the gold, everything he needed, because uh, he thought, oh, this is the God. If he would have been an improvised improviser, he was sort of would look around, seeing, seeing that they were killing all his men, and they were slaughtering everybody, and they took all his gold, and he just said, no, no, take more, because you're a god. And Hermann Cortés sort of say, okay, it's sort of book like, uh, it's very weird what this man does, but he had this conviction, I stick to my idea, to my story. So those are a couple of examples uh, through the ages where applied improv really would help. Um, I just go a little bit back, eh, because I don't have much time, there's lots of things happening, but uh, to the Commedia de Latte, because probably everybody knows, has heard about it, which is the revival of improv theater, I would say. Because after the Greeks and Romans, lots of things happening. Um, but one of the things which was important, the church wanted to do their thing. Eh? The Bible, the stories of the Bible have to be told. But they don't go so much into church. So uh, in front of the churches, there were stages and people improvised the, the Bible, biblical stories. And what made it funny, eh, funny, is there were people with, uh, there were actors, improvising actors, going through the audience with devilish marks, trying to seduce people to do bad things. That was the idea. So like, uh, hey, do we, uh, how do you like this? And so they were really, uh, and they got very popular. Those were the first stand-up comics who, was, who were, became very popular. And they mingled with the comedian the latter people. So let's say uh, the Commedia de Latte for 200 years was sort of the main type of improvised theater. It's not totally improvised because people depended on it, so they had to be very good. So what happened is they really uh, rehearsed uh, small funny sketches, and, uh, but the storyline and the, 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 the text was much of improvised, but lots of the, oops, this is a different thing, Lots of the, the uh, wait, I'll have to adjust a little bit this. Am I, okay? Yes? 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 yes. Thank you. Um, well, that's another 30 seconds and I'm already late. Three so, minutes. three minutes. Oh, two minutes. No. Um, what happens is uh, uh, this went on for 200 years until, and there it comes again, it needs to be controlled. Bigger stage, bigger audience, written down. All the kings loved the improvised comedy and they wanted more of it and everybody got scared. Written down and that was sort of the downfall of the Comedia Latte. So let's say my warning is, um, don't get too good at it. Don't go to bigger stages. Don't think, hey, I'm gonna pay the man, play, play a big city hall uh, because it'll kill the spontaneity and kill the adventure. Um, I'll have, uh, in the two minutes I've left, I'll go to the Im applied improv nowadays. Well, um, the revolution in art, which took place in 1920, eh, as, as I said, it's, uh, it's an history lecture, um, because what happened was that uh, people who know Stanislavski, he sort of used improv techniques to train actors. Many acting schools, eh, I'm, I'm, like for what you did, it's, it, it, it's a great investigation, but it, it's towards the acting thing. Uh, the thing what happened is, oh, one back, uh, that in that period, that 1920, there was a French man who, who totally did the different. His name was Jacques Coupeau, eh, I'm just, spreading out, distributing names. You probably forget it, but anyway. Um, I'm just saying that in 1920, he changed totally the, the theater, and that was the, actually the first one who just said, okay, theater out of nothing. We only have an actor. And he stated, improvisation, and that's what you said too, is an art which has to be learned. So the more you train, the better you get at it. So it's a sort of the same thing, but it's already 1920. 
and he had students and pupils and blah, blah, blah. One of them was Keith Johnston, which most of you probably know. And Keith Johnston was a, was a student of, 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 of. So many exercises which we do nowadays basically are 100 years old. Because this man, Jacopo, he invented an enormous amount of exercises. So, um, but he made theater. And uh, let's say the next step, this is the next step. AIN, the Applied Improv Network, one step further. Basically, it's because um, I remember I've, I've been teaching lots of students to perform. And one of the students came to me and said, hey, this is uh, funny, oh, it's good, this is, I'm learning a lot from your lessons, and maybe you can do it with my team. I said, no, uh, I'm training actors to improvise. No, 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 this is very good. It helps me, so it helped my team. So that was in the sort of 90s, so that's where the applied thing started off. So basically, applied improvisation, what I do and what my colleagues do, are sort of we have the uh, improv exercises from the theater and we adapt them. So my statement at the end is, uh, it's not the exercises. It's the trainer who has the creativity to adapt the exercises to the goal which is necessary. Like the famous one word at a time improv exercise. You can do it in a performance, but you can make a slow version, uh, a focus version, a group version, a take it easy version, and it all depends on what kind of team you have. So it's one exercise, but many purposes, and it's the, it's the trainer itself which does the work. He or she has to adapt the exercises to the training. So um, that's the end of my uh, presentation, sort of one of 15 seconds. Ten. Okay, so I'll, st well, I have to stop anyway, so. Um, because there's lots of things to tell about the applied part, but this is where it all comes from. And uh, all the development on the applied part is great because improvisation is life, that's what it is. And, uh, but now you sort of have an overview on the theater part. And uh, if there is any question, just come to me, or tomorrow I give a workshop about how I apply improv, in or improv theater in organization. And that's it. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>